you got to keep the big picture that, hey, we're changing the world. We're changing the world. If you want to be taken seriously, you have to be consistent. Have to be consistent. We're speaking with people that are sending a pulse to their industry. If none other than Tony Hawk, Todd Peterson. Yes, the Isler, everybody. Thanks for being on, Jordan. The League presents Electric People. Welcome to Electric People. We have a, a pretty cool episode today, a lot of roots in this episode. So we're sitting here with uh, Todd Peterson. What's up, Todd? Good to be here. Thanks Love for it. being here, man. Thanks, I've never for, been no, in... thanks for being here. Yeah, man. The shop. Yeah, I've never been in this shop. It's, it's called The Shop. It's where everyone hangs out. My kid plays music in the basement. Um, the race trucks are prepped. It. All the motorcycles are down there. You should go. Everything ready Why aren't you guys taking those out and ripping them? Yeah, yeah we got to cool. wrap this thing up quickly first. But, go ride some bikes. Um, for you guys that, that may be new with the company or don't know Todd, so Todd's the founder and CEO of Vivint Inc., um, board member, uh, one of the founders, and the largest independent stakeholder for Vivint Solar. Uh, entrepreneur, father, philanthropist, skier, trophy truck racer, name it, right? What else? What else am um, I missing? What adventure things am I missing? Anti-golfer. Anti-golfer. Although I played today. nine holes today. Yeah. And I actually kind of dominated, but I still don't like the sport at all. <laughs> um, let's see. What else do I? Oh, I love to cook. Really? You didn't know that about me? No, the last thing I knew that you were working on was sculpting. I meant to ask if you I, ever it was, figured I mean, that they're out. in my backyard. Who was the sculptor you were working on? Um, Ed, was it Smith? Uh, Smith? I was, was going to, I, I wondered if you knew Jeff But um, the, the, the sculptures are in my backyard. That you made personally? Well, I, so I, to be fair, I did the entire head face. Um, some of the body features are hard if you don't have that you know, background. So he helped me out with that stuff. But they're sculptures of your kids. But they're, they're my kids. I did everything. The eyes, the nose. Oh, I mean, cool. it took, it was probably, it was over a year. I'd go every Saturday pretty much and some nights with my kids. They have to sit there for hours. But it's like the, it's like the mold and the little knife yeah. and the oh, bronzing yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like full Honestly, deal. like I was in heaven doing it. It was like so peaceful. I loved it. That's awesome. So I want to get into that because even being in your shop. So for those that aren't watching this and they're just listening, um, this place looks like you, first of all, but. You seem to be someone that's like inspired by your surroundings. There's motorcycles on the top floor. There's trophy trucks downstairs. There's a lot of cement and steel and well, glass. And, 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 and by the way, every single, if you walk throughout here, there's a bunch of helmets. They're from particular races where something happened. Um, they're body panel parts from races that something crazy or good happened. Um, the, the motorcycle that's sitting out, or it was sitting out there. The gold my Honda? Buddy, well, no, there was another one. I guess it's gone now. I don't know where it went. But my buddy, who's my age, raced the ball um, 1,000 at age 49, point to point, um, 1,300 miles, 52 hours straight, and finished. On that and, bike? And everyone said it was not the, it was, it's another one that's one. somewhere sitting in the shop. But everything in here has meanings. You know, something, it's not just cool, cool decorations, mm -hmm. but stuff that like has meaning to me. Um, Mark Parker's office is like that, CEO of Nike. Have you ever seen his office? Never, no, never been I need there. to send you a picture. It's like, his office is, it's pretty modern, but he like paints like throughout the day and yeah. stuff like that. And like, there's probably 3,000 eclectic art items. There's this, huh. there's this sculpture, I guess you call it a sculpture. It's a shoe made completely of Nike shoes. Or it's a dog made completely of Nike shoes, like a shoe dog, because he's a shoe dog, yeah, yeah. you know? Really cool, but there's similarities huh. there. Um, so just starting out, I kind of want to get into the story. There's a lot of people listening to this that may not know the roots. When Adam and I were talking with you earlier, I became aware that maybe I don't know some of the yeah. roots of where Vivid well, Solar Some of the crazy started. background stuff, yeah. Yeah. So um, you grew up in Idaho Falls to you're, a lot of kids in your family, dad 11, was a dentist. 11 kids, orthodontist, yep. Orthodontist. That's right. Okay. So give us the, the upbringing. From what I understand, you were a very mild and tame youth. Yeah, yeah. Just first uh, in line at church, yeah, yeah. just <laughs> right, hair right, combed right. to the side. Yeah, so I, uh, in fact, it reminds me a lot of my nine-year-old. Really? Yeah. He's, um, I was trying to put him to bed last night, and I think... I asked him to come to bed like, I, I want to say 10 times, probably like 30 times. And he will stare at me stone-faced like he's not hearing me. And I'm like, I don't know what to do. You can't beat a kid. My dad used to spank us. You can't yeah. spank kids anymore. Yeah, but yeah. no, I, I, I grew up with 10 siblings, um, great parents. Um, they, the, what, here's the thing I would say. They taught me um, good ethics and morals, um, work ethic. I was a little bit on the wild side. I um, just like to do my own thing my own way. Um, had a few problems, you know, maybe, let's see, starting in second grade was the first time the police showed up to my home on my behalf. I think you and Mike so, Tyson share that yeah, stat, yeah. actually. Second, did he get second grade? Oh, but no, he had his first trouble when he was I like was just I was just grade. interested in things. But um, yeah, I was in a boys' home at 14. And, um, but look, I, I had a great upbringing, loved, 
I grew up, growing up in Idaho was amazing. Um, the outdoors and learned to love to fish and hunt and ride dirt bikes and all the stuff I still love to do now. But um, the, the, the thing that growing up in a big family actually did for me is it cre- I had to be independent. If I wanted to do something, um, my parents weren't coddling me and running me around to practice and tryouts. And, and even now, honestly, in school, even though I had kind of a wild edge to me, but um, I, I got good grades because I chose to, not because my parents hovered over me and said, hey, get good grades. And so um, it, it forced me to decide what I want to do when I want to do it. And sometimes that was, I made bad choices. I had to live with the consequences. And at other times it worked out for me. But um, yeah, I mean, it, it was great. But you think that trait, um, it's funny you say your nine-year-old's like that because I see in my nine-year-old, I see a lot of things and my wife will look at him sometimes and be like, I don't know where this comes from. And I'm like, I know exactly yeah, yeah, where yeah, it comes yeah. from. But I'm actually kind of like, I don't know, I love the process of kids growing up. Same. So, in, you know, it's interesting. Um, th- let me tell you what my parents did well. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, working with you guys are married. Some aren't. Some have families, relationships. My, my parents did a good job not breaking my will. Um, they... They put some guardrails around my life, um, which, which honestly, like, you know, thinking about the people that we work with and the job that we do, there's got to be guardrails, but you have to allow people to be people um, and let their personalities and their, their drive and desires, like, come out, come through them, and then inspire people through that. Not in a robotic way, the way, you know, people think they have to, you know, be or act um, or manage. Um, so, and it, I think that's important. That's why I like this job. We have a lot of diversity in the type of people that we work with, backgrounds, um, beliefs, and, and everything. And having that all come together, it, it's, it's pretty fun. I love it. We did a, a trip to Tahiti, and the guy that owned the travel agency was the guy that did the Forever Strong, you know that rugby story here in Utah? Like, oh, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. So he ended up owning this thing, and he was there one night, and somebody yelled from the back of this bus. They're like, give us some advice. And he lives by this thing, no regrets or whatever, but in parenting, he said, he's like, you know, what I always told my kids is you're going to make mistakes. Like you can drive fast, stay between certain lines. Yeah. And he said, just try to avoid the ones that are really hard to fix. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. that spirit, uh, that energy that you had is probably the reason you've been so persistent in this industry. The reason that, I mean, working with you for, and this is my 16th year and first year I worked for you directly. You're only 18 years old, man. Yeah, how, uh-huh. How did you start when you were 37 years old, man. Yeah. How, did you start, how old were you when you started? Uh, I signed up when I was 21. 21. Yeah. Wow. In my first summer. Wow. Funny story about that. We had an incentive um, one Saturday when we were out selling. Yeah. And Todd threw out this incentive. It's like, hey, anybody that sells three today gets a pair of shoes. Dude, I, you know what? I think I remember that. So I called him on his cell phone and I said, um, hey, if I get three, can I get snowboard boots instead? And he said, yeah. yeah. And I was like, to just think about the day where it's like, <laughs> can I call you up and be like, hey, don't, like, can I spend an extra the 40 bucks? Still, like, believe me, they still call me. They still do it. Don't you worry. They still call me all the time. But you've always been very approachable. <clears throat> yeah. um, and you've always, you know, of all the years doing this, we can usually find you right here recruiting people and bringing people into the business. It's, what I, it's honestly, so it's funny you say that. Um, that it's, I, I, I don't know if you know this or not, but um, I took over the direct sales program again, which yeah. includes sales, but mostly recruiting and leadership training and management. And, um, you know, I, I enjoy being the CEO and there's, you know, the responsibility of that with public reporting because we have public debt and, you know, operations and finance and all that. And that's, that's fine and dandy, but I love the recruiting side of this business and the development of people. If, if, I really, if you really, it comes down to what do I love to do? Because I, I mean, you guys probably know this now, I don't need to work anymore, but I love to work. Um, I love, you know, there's some days it's hard just like anyone else, but I love the end result of every day when I'm working with people, recruiting them into as long as the program's good and we think ours is and, and the Vivint Solar program's been amazing and having people like open their eyes to what's possible in, in, in themselves and what they can create with other people. There, there's, it's magic to me. So it's, it's, and people always ask me, why are you doing this? How can we keep doing this? Why don't you retire? I'm like, not, because I love what I do. It's well, they've been t- asking you that for- For years, yeah. for years. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I don't want to throw, throw away the talents I've been given and, and that I've had to work hard to develop. And I love the people I work with. Um, it's like a big family, even though, you know, we don't work directly with each other every day, but we're still family, Vivint Solar and Vivint. It's a big family. We've built this thing kind of together and it's continuing to gain momentum and we'll gain even more momentum over time. And 
Well, I don't want, I don't want to be away from that. At some point you guys hatched this plan to decide to get in the solar space. Yeah. Can you walk us through like how that happened? Where that came yeah, from. Yeah, let me. I'll, I'm going to back up even a tiny bit further. Uh, so take it back to the trailer, man. Yeah. Well, so I'll, so interestingly, um, the company started, and it did actually start in a trailer in, in down in Mesa, Arizona. And it started. People, you know, have asked me, "Hey, what was? You know, did you have a business plan? Did you ever think we'd get this big?" Which, by the way, it's not big yet. It's going to be very, very big in the next five to ten years. We're going very big. But um, I had no idea. But um, I had. I was broke. I had no money. Uh, my parents didn't support me. They didn't pay for my school. They didn't pay for, pay any of my bills. None, zero, which was a huge blessing to me because it made me like like not hungry, desperate. I was desperate, so I could not fail. I couldn't fail. There was no choice to fail, which I, I hope that we you know give that to our, that gift to our kids yeah. too. I'm trying to, um, but anyway, starting a trailer and we started out as a direct sales company selling pest control. And I liked it. I enjoyed it. I made money doing it, um, but it it didn't feel like um, I what I wanted to end up being as as a business operator at selling pest control. So um, we were looking for products and services that that could really change the environment of the home. Um, we started out with residential security, um, and then decided at some point in you know the uh, 2005 era that we wanted to build out a platform services business. Now. When when we myself and you know Alex Dunn, you guys know him. Um, when we were talking about it, we'd never tell anyone because we we're we were saying this stuff. We were still we were small back then, not that many employees, not a lot of revenue, and and we thought we'd build out this product services business, a platform business um, through through technology, but it hadn't been done yet. So you know sometimes when you have things haven't been done and you say it, people think you're dumb. So we just keep it to ourselves. But the, the reality is we had this belief that um, there was an opportunity inside of the home to deliver all services in a, in a more unique and better way. We had, hadn't been thinking about solar at that point, um, but it was in, in the mindset of what we're trying to do, which is all services in the home um, through one central platform, one company, um, and the opportunity to be in every, and honestly, in every single home, condo, apartment in, in America, in North America, and you know, maybe potentially you know, worldwide. So we've got a very big, broad vision, but um, this is all the way back in 2005. This is back in we 2005. Were a, we were still a dealer back then. Yeah, from we're still, we were still a dealer, just about to become a, a you know self-sustaining security company. But you know that's how this that's how this stuff works, though. Um, you know you got to think big, you got to think different, and you know a lot of times you know you got to pay attention to the moment, no question. And when you're doing a job like we do, um, what you're doing right now really matters. But if you're not planning out what you intend to achieve in, in the future and have a, a game plan to get there and a, a specific plan on what you need to do to accomplish that, you're, you're just going to let life happen to you. And that, that, that doesn't work usually. But um, yeah, we were talking about it all the way back then. And then to fast forward uh, you know, a couple of years, we became the second largest security company, thanks to you and some of the people you know, in, inside of solar even, um, kind of a, in about six years in the process, started building out our own technology platform, hardware you know, software platform. That was an exciting time, if I can cut you off, because um, we're, we're at this time right now in solar. Uh, our competitors were engaged in a game of chicken to non-profitability, right? Yeah. Everybody was coming back from the summer and yeah. we were selling, Adam was at Pinnacle at the time, so yeah. we, were, we were selling for $39.99 and we're like, we gotta be at 29, I'm getting yeah. beat. And it was around, what, 2010 that we said no. Went the opposite direction. $49.99, yeah. $59.99. Yeah. Um, but when you differentiate on, on technology, technology, that's really where I've learned that, right? It's value, can, and it's yeah. value. You know, it's bringing, and again, what, you know, why solar? Because it's a unique value proposition to the consumer. It's smart, it's clean, it's cheaper. And even if it wasn't cheaper, it's still better. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, we, we saw the opportunity to you know, build this platform business out. And our partner at the time, Goldman Sachs, they had equity, like 25% equity in the company. They called us and kind of randomly said, hey, we're, we're financing some solar companies that are doing residential solar. You know, we, we want to run this company out of our desk in, in New York. Will you guys sell it for us? And they wanted us to outsource installs and do all this stuff. And we, we went, went out and took a look. And we said, well, that, you know, that's not going to work. Two guys on a trading desk can't really manage a company. So started doing a little bit of research in the industry. And um, we're like, you know what? And we actually did some testing. 
We had, we had a couple of guys without even a product to sell, had never done an install. We just did some market testing, knocking yeah. doors. It was Jeremy Long. We just interviewed that's, him. That's right. And Dan that's Reed. exactly right. That's exactly right. And they came back and said, we can sell it. People were interested. Um, that's a pretty simple testing, but actually kind of proves the point. Sometimes people go into very extensive testing and modeling and whatnot. Just talk to the consumer. Um, you know, get, talk to them about value proposition and service offering and They'll, pro- they'll probably indicate whether they'll do it or not in the long term. And so don't waste time and energy on things that aren't going to work. It's funny because a lot of our competitors are still trying to manage their business. Business solar is very different, right? Like we're, we're a business much more like Smart Home where we're, we're a direct sales company, right? Yeah. We're a sales engine. And there's not really a competitor like us because most people are banks trying to sell. Yes. Yep. We're sales companies trying to you know, build a, a deep business. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they're, they're, they're trying, like you say, they're trying to take some piece of the value chain, and Vivint Solar is the entire value chain, which, which for me, and again, I'm not, I'm not working there. I'm, I'm you know, chair, I'm one of the board members, but um, I would, for me, it matters the company that I work for and the service they deliver. It really matters. And again, the older I get, the more and more important that is. And you know, I've been looking at some of the awards that you guys have been getting, and the quality of install and service and um, everything that's happening, it's, that's the right type of company to be with. Um, and, then, and, then, and then it's also, you guys have built the culture. And I look at the numbers in the industry. You guys probably don't. Yeah, but we, don't. we, but we catch pro- them from time to time. Your productivity, <laughs> and this, is, this speaks volumes, productivity inside of Event Solar compared to the, on, a, on a monthly basis or quarterly per rep, you guys are like, it's not even close. Um, and again, that's, that's culture. And that's something that's fun. And again, why do I do keep doing what, I, what I'm doing? Because of the culture and the people and the environment. Um, you know, when, you're, when someone's pushing, it pushes you. So that's, I mean, that's why you guys do it. That's why I do it. So Goldman came to you. Anyway, yeah, Goldman. Yeah, sorry to get distracted. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, that Goldman came and said, hey, can you do this? And we said, no, we'll, we'll run it internally. Um, so we went out. We started selling it um, and installed a few systems, figured out we could do it. We needed a partner. So... This is, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but then we approached Sunrun. You guys know who they are? Yeah, of course. Sunrun. We're aware. Um, so anyway, th- this is actually hilarious. It, it's it's my, maybe reflects badly on me, but um, so we we went out and met with Sunrun. We walked through their offices and they're showing us their operations and they were onboarding. I, don't, I can't remember ten thousand customers a year. I don't remember what it was, and not very many. And we were at the time selling one hundred fifty two hundred thousand um, security systems a year. And they were saying, we can process, you know, 40 accounts a day or whatever. And we're, I, we look like country bumpkins. And I am actually country bumpkin. I'm from Idaho. Um, but they were, they didn't realize the magnitude of our operations. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it was, it was kind of funny. We met with them. We said, hey, we'd like to, you know, put business through you. You pay us, you know, kind of like a dealer. Uh, they weren't calling it a dealer model at that time. So they said, great. What are you looking for? And we said, we'd like equity. You know, we think we can you know, create a lot of value here. We can, you know, be a major player in this, player in this industry um, kind of overnight. Um, and I'm sure they didn't believe us. But anyway, they came out to Provo. This is Ed Finster. He's the, I think he's the chairman of the board, but he was one of the founders. Um, came out to Provo with his team. And, you know, we said, hey, we want equity and we want residual because, you know, the customers pay for 20 to 30 years. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, we want some capital up front so we can pay the sales reps and so they can get, you know, money up front and whatnot. And so um, they came into our, into our boardroom and they started writing this big plan up on the board around what, how much they were going to pay us um, up front, how much they're going to pay us residually over time. And I'm, I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're, now I'm, I'm, I didn't graduate from college, so I'm not too smart, but I'm smart enough to add up numbers. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, mm, goodness, they're, they're, gonna, they're proposing to pay us half of what they're paying their, their people that sell for them directly up front and over time combined. Not half up front, the other half over time, half as much including over time. And I'm like, this is super funny because Ed thinks I'm a dumbass. This is super, I was super intrigued. I'm like, I hadn't said anything yet. I'm like, Ed Finster thinks I'm a dumbass. Sorry for the language. But that, that's what I thought. That was, the, thought in, that the was in my brain. <laughs> that's exact. I'm like, this is super hilarious. Now, he's got some fancy you know, degree or whatever. Stanford, I don't even know where he went to school. But anyway, um, I raised my hand. I'm like, oh, this is, this is interesting. Why would, we get, why would we accept getting paid half 
of what you're paying your own people over up front and over time compared to what they're getting up front. Why would we do that? And I just don't think they thought we had the brain cells to process it. Put that together. Now, no one else on my team did actually because it was so offensive that no one else came to the conclusion that I did because there's no way that someone would offer, and especially a company with the sales capability we yeah. have, yeah. installation they digital. Didn't know. It was it was funny. So I'm like, hey, are you seriously proposing this to us? Um, and it caught them off guard because they thought we would never catch on, which is super weird, yeah. by the way. Um, they had us leave our own boardroom. We went outside. We came back in. And um, anyway. The deal didn't happen. They, no, the deal didn't happen because there was some additional offensive offer. And um, we said, well, let's just go head to head. Let's go compete. So, you know, we start we started doing it on our own, raised a little bit of capital um, internally and then got some financing and, you know, started running the business. So, but it was, a, it was kind of, it was a side business initially for us right. that became something that's pretty, pretty magical, pretty amazing. Well, that's when I started was, uh, they just opened up New Jersey and um, Chance called me and he's like, hey, we just started solar. Yeah. And would you be willing to come meet with, you know, Todd and whatever. So I think I brought my wife down and, and we met with you and you yeah. basically sold us on the idea of solar. And at the time, there was just the one team out in Jersey and we just, I think, rented the warehouse in Boston. But everything yeah. was like running on a little... No, it was small. It was so small. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it was like we were running uh, solar out of just a little wing of smart home at that point. Right? But so. here's the interesting thing, though. Um, even though at that... And I remember that, actually. Mm -hmm. It was so small. I knew we had it because if someone else is doing something and and... You know, we're, we're pretty good at, um, you know, repeating a process and then, and then making it a better process and that's replicatable across the board. Um, we know we can do that. If, if you can add great people to that, this is, this is in any business. You add great people. It's not even the best idea or the best everything. It's the best people with a good idea and good processes. You can succeed no matter what. So, that, you know, that's why we went out and got the people we did. And we knew if someone else was doing it, we brought the right people in. And we, you know, put the time and attention to the process and the systems. We'd get it figured out. We you know, we could compete in the market. How did you? So how did you find Tongi? So Tongi. So this is. A, I mean, you're going to bring up another offensive story. So Tongi. Well, funny should, enough. I mean, just for yeah. so everyone that's listening, that's new to the company. Yeah. Tongi Sarah was officially the first CEO. He was. Of yeah. Yeah, he was. So funny enough, a, a private equity firm, which this is my life. Um, a private equity firm out of the Bay Area, TPG. Um, one of the partners, I can't remember how, but he found out about our company and wanted TPG to buy it. This is this is Goldman Sachs owned 25%, but they wanted to buy out Goldman and then buy some additional equity. So this partner of TPG approached us, um, you know, went through our, our model and our the growth of our business and, um, you know, wanted, they were, I think they were going to offer I want to say it was 600 million. I can't remember it at the time. It was somewhere around there, which by the way, would have been a great investment. Um, and so we, he, we, he actually presented this to TPG and their investment committee. And um, they actually just pr pretty much just poo-pooed our state of Utah. We won't invest in a Utah company and especially not people knocking doors, which they didn't understand. They, they roll like that in the they, Bay sometimes they outside of the well, industry. Well, they just didn't understand. This isn't, we're not knocking doors. We're, we're, we're this call. I mean, what you do and what we do, um, think about it like it's like the Apple store. If you want to, if you want to get the best product and service from Apple, go in an Apple store um, and have the professionals teach you how to, you know, do or buy the product, integrate the product into your home and your life. That's what we're doing. We're just doing it in their home. They don't have to go to a store. So it's in home consultation. It's magic. And, and by the way, same thing a realtor does. Same thing a realtor does. When you talk about a complex, I mean, you know, can you sell solar over the phone? Sure. But it's probably a better experience and it's more correct if you're in home and doing it right in front of the consumer. Same with, same with smart home generally. And the, the more and more products and services that get added to it, the more necessary it is to be inside their home. And it's actually convenient. Um, they don't have to leave. They don't have to go somewhere. And we're there right then. We get it done. But anyway, they... They, they kind of, they just said, you know, we're not doing this as a dumb company. It's not going to survive. They can't compete with ADT, all these excuses or whatever. 
and we met Tongi through that process. And, um, um, and Solar was kind of, had been incubated at that point, and he said, hey, I want to be part of this thing. So anyway, we hired him, and he did a great job. He was, you know, yeah. super, well, you know, ran hard, and, and, and then, you know, things didn't work out. But My first really early memory of you, and, you know, I worked at a competitor yeah. doing the home security stuff, and I'd met with you a handful of times and just kind of out of sheer loyalty just stayed at Pinnacle. And, um, and then... I, everything kind of happens for a reason. I always believe that. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. I don't think I would actually be at Vivint Solar today had I come over earlier with you. Yeah, maybe, that's maybe, probably maybe true. Not, could be, so. could be. But um, either way, I'm in Boston and I was managing. Have you heard the story when Todd brought out all the investors to my office? I don't know if I have. So, Blackstone. Yeah, so um, before Blackstone bought us, Todd brought out a team. Oh, I think of, I have yeah. heard this. 10 people in suits yes and Tongi called me the day the morning of and he goes hey just FYI um Todd Peterson's gonna be at your office today he wants to come see your correlation meeting and he's bringing some investors with him so just make sure you run a really good meeting I have no idea who these people are we were meeting like <laughs> in closets back then <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. that early round of, yeah, yeah. of, of office little rough little yeah. rough little me I'm just like oh sweet like I'll just run my meeting and um it was so funny so we had a really good meeting and it was Alex and Todd show up with all these guys. I have no idea who these guys are. But the cool part was uh, we ran a great meeting. We had a guy, we do the basketball shot, get, you know, get some sales. Uh, I think Alex um, up the ante like a grand if this kid hit a basketball shot from like way deep in the Did office. Alex play? Because he's surprisingly Alex, athletic. He like did play. Alex, super athletic. When, Ad, when Alex plays, it's like, whoa, you're like, I thought you'd come in at a level six and you're full 10. Yeah, like, yeah. He's a good player. And he can shoot the three too. He so, looks like he should play down low, and he, he likes the three. <laughs> so this kid hits a shot for a grand in front of the Blackstone yeah, people, yeah. which was really fun, yeah, was right? Crazy, yeah. And um, everyone dogpiles this kid. But then Todd uh, says to me, he goes, hey, I actually want to have one of these guys come shadow you for the day and you know see what, what we do. And I was just thinking, yeah, that's fine. I've got a spare polo and in my trunk. I, no, he was in just dress shirt and slacks. His <laughs> name is Bruce. Oh, it was Bruce. Bruce, it was Bruce, yeah. Oh, was I it think really? it was Bruce. Didn't he get up on the roof no, on no, an install? No. Or that was, he did get on an install. In we, his we, first, we first drove out to a little neighborhood that we were just crushing it yeah. in. And, um, and then after, he's like, all right, this guy's going to go shadow you. And, you know, Todd's like, hey, like, you know, I need to get some sales here. Like, show these guys what we can do, you know. And I'm like, okay, you know, yeah. no pressure. <laughs> and um, I didn't really understand even the magnitude of, like, the meeting and all that stuff. And I went out and I was trying my Well, there's hardest. only two billion on the line. There's two, two billion, billion on the line. Two get a couple <laughs> get, get me a couple sales. Two billion. And Let's go. I went out and bageled. Oh gosh. I went, I went out and I knocked for like five hours. I got in one home. And I mean I was selling like two or three a day at the time yeah. too. And I just um, just couldn't get anything going. I felt so stupid. And I just remember texting Todd and be like, hey man, like You're up. I blew this. You're up. <laughs> I apologize. Hey, I went back and closed it. Don't worry. You did. <laughs> Thank I went, you. No, no. They lo- actually, the funny thing is they liked how raw it was. Mm-hmm. Um, it was real. It was exactly what was happening and did happen. And yeah. we didn't like drum anything up or make, it wasn't fake. It was real. Right. And um, they appreciated that. And then um, who was it? Was it Jeremy Long? We walked down the street with him. It was actually with Bruce and, um, and um, who else was with us? It was a big group. Um, yeah, but I mean. They got to. They figured out that we really don't just knock doors. We like we get to know entire neighborhoods. Yeah, and we we're hunt. like the, well, we we're the the consultant inside the neighborhood. Yeah, I'd been working in this neighborhood for a good month and a half, but we already had probably fifteen installs. Plus, smart home had come through there the year before, and there was like 40, 50 smart homes in the mm-hmm. neighborhood. Yeah. So orange signs everywhere. Yeah. So it was a good spot. Yeah. Talk about. Um, was it your grandfather that gave you the advice that you founded a lot of your business principles on the two? Well, was it your grandfather? No, your my father? dad. But so my my grandpa. So one piece of advice my grandpa gave me that was that I try I try to live by. Um, I, he was the mayor of Idle Falls, um, and he, my my grandpa, some personal background, had polio as a child. So he, he had br- like metal braces. He had to walk with metal braces as an adult. He did? as an adult, yeah. And um, yeah, I still remember him. He'd come home from work and you know unstrap he, you know the he'd unstrap his braces and he put you know those full piece zo- zipper suit what's it called the like a jumpsuit jumpsuit thing? whatever you know the old man like wearing onesie. onesie thing man big old thing was like light green wore it every day and 
He'd sit there That's and watch the kick in it. Yeah, oh yeah. But um, and then got run over at age twelve and you know smashed his feet. And the car ran over him. And anyway, I, my grandpa was the mayor of Idle Falls for I don't know it was like twelve years. And I'd go to his office all the time from very little, and I'd sit there and listen to him have meetings. And he always had the most amazing attitude. Like no matter what, I never heard him have anything but a positive attitude. He'd go into a room and. Like he brought energy to the room. You know, you have people that like suck the blood out of your neck. Yeah. Um, you feel it, right? When they come like, in. It's oh like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, I hope I have Is some left, <laughs> something left when they leave. Yeah. Not my grandpa. He added to everyone, always. And he'd always, people would say, how are you doing, Eddie? And that, they just called him Eddie. And he'd say, I've never had a bad day. He'd always say, I've never had a bad day. Um, and I just remembered that when I was a kid. My grandpa was saying, I've never had a bad day. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. My grandpa's never had a bad day, which you know he did. Of course he did. Right. But he never, he, he didn't because of his attitude, the, men, the mental state. Um, the, first, the only time I ever heard him say he was having a bad day was two days before he died. My dad and I went over to see him. I was 16. And um, anyway, he's laying in bed. He had heart problems and whatnot. And he said to my dad, he's like, he's like, son, I think I'm finally having a bad day. First time I ever heard him complain ever what in his cool life. cool thing. So, you know, that, and that's honestly like with what, we're, what we do and what we're allowed to do. I mean, there are jobs where you just turn your brain off. Turn your brain off, clock in, do your job, go home, get your salary, get your, what are, whether you do an incredible job or a decent job, full bonus, um, no stress. And that's, that's actually fine for some people. I think some people are maybe built that way. Although not super satisfying at the end of the day, the job we have you have to bring that attitude. And if you do and you work hard, even when you do have tough days, man, it's like, it is it is satisfying. If you make it through those hard days especially. Yeah. So I always think about that. My dad, his, when I, my dad was interesting. When I dropped out of school, I was going to BYU. I dropped out because I had started the, the Vivint, the base of the company back, it was 1992, I guess. It was called Creative back then? Creative Marketing Concepts. Crappy name, but didn't know what else to call it. But um, it, you might bring back some creative marketing. I, I need to. Swag. I should, man. Like CMC. Like the throw throwback, CMC. The throw. We called it CMC. Yeah. No, you got to do some <laughs> yeah. throwbacks. I swag. should. I, that's a great idea. Like actually. the legends of Supercross. Yes. You know how they but, do that? Yes. Like bring back but the it has to be you? something extra special to get that. I mean, for real. So, you know, I dropped out of school. And, my, and again, I mentioned earlier, my parents, when I say they didn't give me any money, um, I, I, I came off a, a Mormon mission and my parent, my dad took me down to Provo. And I had to live, and this was super humbling. I had to live in a one bedroom, like basement apartment with my buddy who had just gotten married a month earlier. I had no money. I had no, I had no car. I lived on, I slept on their couch for three months. Brent Bartholio was his name. And Brent he and had Susan, just gotten married. I bet Brent he was and Susan had just gotten married. No, and it was thin walls. It was yeah. horrible. We ate <laughs> breakfast in the morning together. I was humiliated. Yeah. Because I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm 21 years old and I have no money. I can't support myself. I'm eating their eggs. And if I want cheese, I could ask for their cheese. I didn't like that. I didn't like like someone else supporting me. I didn't like that feeling. Not that you know we don't need help every once in a while. We do, but um, I just I, it was Susan had to take me to work. Um, or, or Brent picked me up from work. I mean, it, it was like it, it, it ingrained in me this drive to to at least have the success to always be able to stand on my own feet no matter what. Mm -hmm. But um, anyway, I dropped out of school to start you know because I had started the company. My dad calls me up and says, hey, I'm going to come down to Provo from, from uh, Idle Falls, and let's, let's talk about school. So he comes down, and it was interesting. He didn't actually try to talk me back into going to school because I was paying for it. And um, he said, hey, you know, Mom and I talked, and if you, you know, it's about money, um, you know, we'll pay for school. And I said, no, Dad, this isn't about money. I made like 400000 last year. I don't, I don't need Dad coming through with the retention school, effort. <laughs> which is more money than my dad made a year. But... Um, so this isn't about money. This is like I like something in my guts telling me that this is what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what it is. Um, I don't even know what I'm doing yet. I've never really run a company before. I had a house cleaning business. Um, but anyway, my dad said, well, um, I'm not even going to try to talk you back into going to school. But um, if you're going to run a company, and this was a very, very quick conversation. Um, my dad said, you've got to remember that your core asset, your biggest asset in your company are your employees. Um, and you have to treat them like gold. And then you have to deliver the best service you possibly can to your customers. And the profit side of things, the money side, 
it'll work itself out. So if you're focused on the money, um, it'll never work or you'll never be satisfied. And that was it, kind of gave me a hug, drove back to Idle Falls. It was, it was, it was probably like, I want to say it was 10 minutes, it was probably like four minutes. My dad's a man of few words, but um, very wise. And I've tried to really try to live by that. And people may not think it's perfect, but um, when I think about the uh, every day what I do, and I know how you guys operate and the people you're trying to bring on, there are people that are looking at this company, you know, Vivint Solar and saying, should I be part of, the, part of that, should I not? The culture there and the culture I hope to have in my company is when people come on, we want to provide the best environment for them with the most opportunity. That doesn't mean the highest pay scale, by the way, um, which is super funny. People sometimes say, well, what, where's the highest pay scale? Or you guys probably never deal with that. We do. Um, it's the best opportunity to grow and have growth and bring people on to succeed and, and create value in their life and other people's lives, which, by the way, ends up being the most money yeah. and the most satisfaction. Um, we it's something you want chase to see the, the money. Do you want to see the highest pay scale or do you want to see the highest 1099? That's right. Like, what do you want to see? That's right. You know? and, or the and, happiest customers, the longest sustained careers. Or... That's right. It, that's, and it's, it's funny because um, sometimes when people are younger, they don't understand that they, they haven't had experience, which, by the way, the, the experience at Pinnacle was magical for you. Yeah. Not, not that they, you know, I actually like those guys now. I hated them when I competed with them, but um, they weren't trying to build a long term business. Um, they were, you know, which is totally fine. It was more of a short-term play, shorter-term play. Um, and they didn't do some of the things necessary they probably do now to create long-term value in a sustainable business. Yeah. But for me, this is my legacy, man. This is this is not this is my business legacy. It's not my total my, my total legacy is am I a nice person or not? That's actually at the end of the day, that's how I want to be measured. Am I nice or not? Not back to preschool, right? Not like you do I have nice. the sickest shoes. Are you comparing? Because I think your shoes I got are crappy. Than no, mine. whatever. These are just the cheap. Yeah, but Adidas, they got man. that super technology sole in them. Which have you ever worn these? No, I people can't. make fun of them. They're so comfortable. It's just they feel like slippers. We're a Nike thing, man. I can't wear Adidas. That's um, the thing. I have a few Nikes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I think that advice from your dad, though, that, like, because I remember that story honestly, yeah, and it's yeah. cool. Like, what a what a cool thing for your grandpa, and what a cool thing for your dad, because we've taught that to our people and. Yeah. You know, we, we had times, I remember at, at when, we were, when I was um, working at Vivint Inc., where, man, our reviews were really bad and things were really hard and we had poor customer experience. And then we worked and worked and worked and started getting awards for customer yeah. service. Well, the cool thing is the culture that you've kind of laid the foundation for. It was just a couple years ago that our installs, it's like, man, we would do anything to get customers to not check those reviews yeah. because we're a startup. And now to hear that our 82-point inspection is the highest standard of installation in yeah. the industry, Honestly, like to go back that advice from your dad, yeah. I mean, think of how many people that has. And it's, but, and it, but honestly, it's kind of funny. It's everything. Um, it, it's, it, it, when it boils down to a business succeeding, that's everything. If, you're, if you have a bunch of employees and they're unhappy um, or they don't feel like they're, they're getting value or gaining value or skill set inside of your organization, they're not going to do a great job for the customer because we're all, we're all customer facing, whether you're a salesperson or an installer or operations, even finance and HR, legal, whatever, we all are consumer facing, whether that's the, the consumer being the employee base or, you know, our customer base. That's right. So everything outside that kind of doesn't matter. Now, if we're bad operators and we don't have, you know, financial acumen, then, you know, we don't deserve to be running a company anyway. But um, that's why I like, that's why I like, you know, what, what's been built. I want to give you a chance to brag a little bit about David Bywater. Yeah. So we went through a transition with a former CEO, yeah. and for a minute, Alex Dunn takes over yeah. as the interim, and then you guys decide to bring on Dave. What was it about uh, Bywater that you just felt like he was the right guy for the job, and why does having someone like him make such a difference for a company? Why Bywater, and what's Bywater about? And, and this, I'll describe Bywater this way, um, or, or why I love David Bywater. He calls me the other night, um, and we're talking about you know some pay scale changes and some different things happening. It's kind of back and forth on you know consequences and upside, downside, and whatnot. Um, but we're talking about our families and, and, and all that. And his son's coming home from a mission, and Today. yeah, it's amazing. And he's a total stud. But um, this is why By Bywater you know does what he does so well. His he he, he says, hey man, my my nine year old had a game. He actually missed it for you guys. Thank you very much. 
Um, his son, uh, bottom of the ninth, um, they're down three runs. He's nine or 10, 10. Stands up and jacks a, a grand slam home run. That's the Bywaters right there. Grand slam home run, bottom of the ninth, down three. When they have to deliver. When they have to deliver, they deliver. That's David Bywater. So when I, I've known him for, geez, I don't know, 25 years. That's all I know about him. Um, that no matter what, no matter, no matter the number of hours, the amount of work, the amount of stress, um, it's going to be done right. Um, not, you know, the biggest words or the biggest, um, you know, ex- actually never excuses, but biggest story. It's always complete execution. Um, and, he's, and he is, you know, mastered attention to detail. Um, and they jack the, the Grand Slam home run when they need to. So that's by water. <laughs> that's by water. Yeah, he's the man. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about racing for a second. Sure. Um, so trophy <laughs> truck racing has become a pretty big part of your life. It's yeah. probably more than a hobby at this point. Yes. Right? Um, so I, we've talked to the guys a lot. This is a year-round thing for us. And, yeah. um, you know, a lot of guys express that oh, I get burnt out and stuff like that. And one of the things that I believe is in order to not get burnt out, in order to bring energy to your job, you have to have a life that you're excited about. Yeah. You have to have... You have to have something you're doing that you're stoked on, and you have to have things good at home and, and yeah. stuff like that. So maybe talk about what you get out of racing and 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 what that does for you. Well, let me. So I'm going to start with home because that's like to me the most my my base is home. And in fact, I'll just say this: I had a really hard day yesterday. Everyone does. I had a really when I say stressful day, it was crazy. The amount of things we're trying to do inside of our company, um, grow and scale and compete and. All, there are a lot of things happening. And not very often do I feel my heartbeat in my temples. I did yesterday. I called my wife up and I'm like, hey, I need, you know, I need, like, I just need you to, like, be near me for a while. I need your energy. My wife brings me energy. It's important to me, first and foremost, to be a great husband and a great dad. That's when I wake up in the morning, um, I literally am thinking, now, I'm not perfect, but I'm just saying my, my objective is to make my wife happy every day because um, I want my kids to be proud. I want to make my wife proud. She actually thinks it's sexy when I work hard and accomplish. That works. I mean, she, she that does. That works. Um, so at least she tells me that. Maybe she's... <laughs> actually, she still likes me. It's kind of cool. I like it. We're, we've been married 25 years. But um, anyway, super important. The, the racing thing is super interesting. Um, I did it just as a... As a buddy challenge 10 years ago the first off-road race i did and um it was really really hard we broke down non-stop got stuck in the mountains seven thousand feet in mexico freezing our tails off this is the first baja 1000 we did and um it it was miserable miserable it was like 48 hours of misery and uh, cactus all over our face swelling from laying in the desert freezing next to my buddy i kind of (laughs) Called up with quite a bit just to keep warm, and um, and we didn't actually finish the race, um, but it was one of the greatest experiences I'd ever had because it was so hard. I was starving. I'd wet myself, thrown up on myself, and um, I'm like, that was cool. That was really cool. Um, but I saw the big trophy trucks and the big professional racers that ra- Red Bull because yeah, that was in a different monster. class, right? You yeah, we were in like these a, little wimpy razors like and souped up razor, They're racing. Yeah. They're racing these thousand horsepower trophy trucks. Um, and, and for me, just like in business, when, I, when, I, when I'm thinking about our company now, the companies, combined companies, I'm like, well, um, I haven't quite got, there's some companies, put, they're pushing the trillion dollar mark. I haven't got my brain around that yet. But $100 billion, $200 billion mark, I can get there. Um, so when, I'm, when I was down in the little Razor class, I'm looking at these guys in these trophy trucks. I'm like, well, I could do that. Now, little did I know that they, they, most of them start out racing when they were in their teens. Didn't know that at the time. And when I, you know, to fast forward, when I first bought a trophy truck to race in the pro class, the guys supported me and were like, hey man, um, these guys do this professionally. This is their living. Um, you're, you run a company, just go have fun. If you can just finish a race, that's magical. And I'm like, well, I, wanna, I actually wanna compete. Um, I don't wanna just be in a race and finish a race. Who can't, everyone can do that. They're like, no, no, no. People have done the Baja 1000 15 times I've never finished. I'm like, that's not interesting to me. I want to, I want to compete. So, um, they, you know, they're, they're kind of telling me I can't do it, and which really fired me up. Um, so, you know, it, part of what I love is the, the competitive nature of it. But I, like, so I have the Baja 500 coming up in, uh, I don't know, three, four weeks. And um, I'm already like nervous about it. 
and it's not just nervous because of there's you know potential to get hurt and all that stuff, but the mental anguish and physical pain I've got to go through to not to it's not just driving a race to push the limit of my ability to see and feel and and do everything and 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 hopefully not die and be and be competitive. It's really really hard, and especially at my age. I'm 50. Most of the guys I race against are in their 20s or 30s. There's a, there's a couple of guys that are a little older, but for the most part, no. And they all do it professionally. It's their full time job. So um, it's 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 the same for me. It's the same though. Um, you know that that competitive nature. Now it's a bit scarier racing than you know running a company. But um, you know pushing myself even in the last think back to the last three months. I've had so many 16 hour days. It blow your mind. And sometimes I'm up till three or four in the morning, and then going again the next morning. And it, it's like I don't have a choice. Just like in racing, well, you do have a choice. Um, and the choice is: Do I quit or do I go dominate? There's no in between for me. There's just not in between because in between sucks. Every time I'm in between, I'm totally dissatisfied with the outcome. Even though there may be some material, you know, financial positive outcome, the outcome to myself and the people around me is not what it, it should have been. So. The racing feels like running the company to me, just scarier. And then, you know, it's something different that, and, it's, and it's, it is adrenaline. But the funny thing is, um, when I think about what I want to do at Vivint, um, there's adrenaline to it because it's hard. People don't think that we can do it. We can't compete with Amazon and Google. You guys are competing with like the biggest companies in the world, the utility companies. And there's, there's Comcast too, sort of. ADT is absolutely a dead thing in the past. Isn't that crazy? It, which is nuts. Because they were the monster. They, we, we ne- I, never, I didn't aspire to beat them. Now I aspire to put them out of business. And we almost sold our company um, last year. Well, it was a little over a year ago. And um, th- this, this is crazy. People would think this, I, I'm insane. So it was, it was close. It didn't happen. But it got very, very close to the point where we were negotiating like my employment terms. I was, I was at a, a dinner with this, with this company and I was sick to my stomach, like sick to my, and my check, my personal check was ridiculous, um, ridiculous. Um, the money side of it, I didn't, that didn't factor at all because I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not done. I'm not, not done. I'm just starting right now. And if had that happened, honestly, I would have been super disappointed. The future is so big and bright. Um, I can't, I can't wait. I'm, I'm stoked for the next 10 years. Um, well, thank you for sitting down with us. Yeah. Man. It's been awesome to, to to hear some of the tales and to to feed off your energy. I think uh, hopefully, and I'm sure you do, when you look back and look at the the company that you've been a part of and the company that you've built, you have a lot of pride. It's changed my life personally and all of my friends. I just feel like I'm part of a big program that's doing something good that has incredible opportunity. We've taken advantage of that and come together and done something kind of special, but special that's going to become incredible at some point. I hope I die at some point and say, that was cool. Um, but every, it's funny, you know, I, we get to a certain point, I'm like, man, that just wasn't good enough. I wasn't thinking big enough. So, but we are thinking big now. Thanks for hanging out with us today. This is Electric People. Take these principles and go be electric. <laughs>